All right, but without further ado, um, let's see who our hosts are. So we're joined by Helena, Steve, and Alicia from CODA, and um, I'll let them introduce themselves too. Hey everybody, uh, super happy to be here. My name is Helena, I'm a product design lead at CODA, and I lead our ecosystem and megaphone team. Hey folks, great to meet you. Uh, my name is Sungjin Steve. I lead the team focused on designing uh, experience for teams and scaling monetization for the business. Hey all, thanks for calling in. I'm Alicia Salvino. I'm a product designer on the ecosystem team at Coda. All right, so now I'm gonna hand it off to Helena to get us started and to share her files with us. All right, here we go. Cool, so yeah, we're uh, part of the Coda design team. Um, and so just for a little bit of context, uh, for those who are not so familiar with Coda, Coda is an all-in-one doc, so we combine the best of docs and spreadsheets into a single canvas. So companies like Pinterest use Coda to do OKR tracking, goal tracking, um, but teams also use Coda to, um, you know, for their wikis or their hubs um, to track projects as a project hub as well. On the design team, we use Coda to run our design crits uh, to share work and get feedback on our work. Uh, in my personal life, I use Coda for family meal planning and my personal to-do list. So truly an all-in-one doc, so many different scenarios. Um, we have over a million users and over 25,000 teams using Coda. So that's just a little bit of the flavor of the kind of stuff that we're working on. And you'll see kind of, you know, Coda sprinkled throughout this um, as we go along. All right. Oh. So yeah, I'll be talking today about how to co-create your team rituals. So when we talk about rituals, rituals are really just the practices and the routines that your team does that really make your team kind of special and what your team is. So you might think back to maybe a meeting that your team always has that's um, you know, kind of unique or something that your company does all the time, maybe once a week or once a month that um, you know, kind of gets the team going or makes the team click. So that's kind of what we mean by at rituals and um, by rituals. And that's something that we're really excited about at Coda. And so the question here is, how do you co-create these rituals for your team? Um, and as the design lead um, on the ecosystem and megaphone team, this is something that I was experiencing myself and wondering myself. So we had a bit of a challenge um, on, on our team. One was that we were a distributed team. So some people were working in offices, some people were working remotely fairly common problem. Um, we were also, um, we're also a cross-functional team. So we work with product and design super jointly at Coda, um, our product and design team are, are one. Um, and Steve will talk more about how we collaborate across those two things. And then finally, and this was really the trickiest part was that we're working across two different problem areas. And so while our teams, um, the ecosystem and megaphone team have shared goals and shared tech, um, they, they are different, they have different contexts. Um, so that was kind of like one major challenge. How can we create a team that feels unified, um, you know, and holistic um, and addresses all of these, you know, these, these differences and ways of working? So yeah, the question was, how can we be intentional about how to work together? Um, and really taking account as well our different working styles, which, you know, would be the, you know, every team has people with different working styles. So that's really a problem that, that everyone can really relate to. So what we decided to do was to run a team retro in order to take a moment to co-create our team rituals. Um, and so the first thing was really about like making space for that time to reflect with your team. So when we ran our team retro, it was around the new year and we had been working together for a little over a year. We had just shipped a really, really big project. Um, and so it felt like a good time to reflect on what the ways that we had been working together as a product and design team, but also a good time to think about how we might be intentional about working together in the future. The other kind of interesting thing was that we wanted to do like a team retro format or a retro format, which you might be familiar with for um, running retros for products and for projects. So usually you might run a retro at the end of a really big project 
or at the end of the quarter, but usually it's pretty focused on kind of the product and the project itself. But we wanted to do a retro that was really focused on the team and how we might work together. Um, and we wanted to really accommodate for different working styles, being that we were distributed and we were a cross-functional team and you know we just had different preferences as well. Cool, so I made a template that I'll run through now to get pretty tactical about how you might actually run this retro. So let me hop in there. So I'm sharing my Fig Jam screen now, just in case. Cool, so this template is based on the retro that we ran as a team. And so, like I said, the goals are really about how do you co-create your team rituals, be intentional about that, um, make space for these multiple working styles. And importantly, also like experiment with new rituals. Like at the end of this retro, you should be ready, your team should be ready with ideas to say, hey, how about we try this? And how about we try this other thing? So when we ran this, we really only took one hour and we just used it, uh, we did it in the time of our regular product and design weekly, which was a meeting we already have. Depending on the size of your team, you might wanna use like an hour and a half, um, but it should feel like low lift and lightweight enough where you can make time for this and it doesn't have to be like a huge burden. And maybe you even do this like a, a couple times a year, you know, so that you do have time to reflect and be experimenting with different rituals. Um, so let's say you're like, okay, that sounds interesting. I, I feel like I need a, you know, my need, my team needs a retro. We want to be intentional about how we work. How might you actually go about this? So besides kind of like scheduling the time with your team, definitely give them a heads up, you know, what this meeting is about so they can go in with the right mindset. And then while this is definitely a team um, activity and you want to be co-creating, you do want to have a facilitator. Um, and so the role of the facilitator here, one is to just like set the mood, set the vibe from the beginning, um, especially if you're working remotely. Sometimes it can be difficult to gauge, you know, just how somebody's day is going. You never know what kind of Zoom meeting they just came out of. So just set the mood, get the vibe right. You know, we're going to be reflecting, we're going to be taking steps. So um, do that. And then other things that the role, the facilitator needs to do, a little bit more logistical, just like timekeeping, you know, you have a limited amount of time, so make sure that you're keeping the conversation going. Um, you're moving on to the next steps um, in order to kind of get people to an actionable place, if, if that's what you want. If you want this to be about, okay, like what new rituals are we gonna try now? What new practices? So um, the rest of the template is, you know, is pretty self-explanatory, you know, starting with an icebreaker, like I said, to set the mood, that can be really helpful to just help people break out of, you know, whatever is happening in their day. Um, you know, we use this little sticker here, but Donut also has this cool widget um, with like water cooler topics. I love this question. What's the best thing you've eaten recently? Um, lots of food questions here. We definitely like that on the Coda team. And then otherwise you just go into kind of just, um, you know, more typical retro questions. So you wanna dedicate a lot of time to just giving your team time to write down answers to this um, vote, like have time to read each other's answers, and then you'll vote on it. Um, and then once you get the voting going, then you'll look at, okay, maybe there's a lot of votes, like on a particular sticky note, you want to lead the discussion that way. You might also just want to ask your team, hey, like, was there something that particularly stood out to you that you really want to talk about? And you'll direct it there. Um, so, you know, questions like how might we best use our meeting time together? What are we already doing well? So making sure you're like shining a light on bright spots that are already happening. Um, what are things we're not doing that we should try? And here you might want to prompt your team to think about, um, you know, maybe there are, you know, teams in another part of the company that are doing something interesting. Why don't you try that? Or maybe they've worked somewhere else. They want to try something from there. Uh, maybe they're watching a Figma live stream. They want to try something from that. Um, every team is so different, so it really is about experimenting and seeing what works for your team. And then finally, making sure you're getting to that actionable step. Uh, cool, so, you know, we reflected, we voted, we discussed, what are some ideas that stood out to you that you want to take forward in your team? Um, and here, you know, even though, um, you know, one person might be facilitating, anybody can bring forward these ideas, of course, and anybody can also like be an owner to make, make these ideas happen. So make sure you kind of like assign a lead, somebody who's going to, you know, get going with that ritual soon. So to give you an idea of um, the kind of rituals that we experimented with after this, 
after we ran our retro. Um, one was that we uh, created this kind of like social work time uh, block on our calendar for the whole PD team. Um, and so it's really, really flexible time that we met, uh, that we use to meet on this spatial tool called Spatial Chat, but you might also use a tool like Sprout or something similar. Um, and we just come on here and share work or just talk about what's going on. People drift in and out. It's pretty flexible. And depending on the day, you know, sometimes it's more full or less full. But that's kind of the point. People wanted more flexible time to just meet up. Another thing that we experimented with was um, we wanted to find ways to share work in a really lightweight way um, and just share context in that sense. So we started sharing screenshots um, using these little emojis on Slack. Um, it's just meant to be like an FYI, like I don't want a lot of context on this, I'm just sharing out. Um, and this is actually something that I saw at Khan Academy on the design team there, um, which I really liked. And so kind of borrowing a pattern from another team and seeing how it works here. Cool. So that's the, you know, that's how we ran our team retro. That's a bit of the template. Um, I would say the main thing is, well, yeah to make time for reflection with your team. Um, you know, I think that's just the starting point. It can be difficult to make time for these extra things, but just making even a small set of time, like an hour can be really helpful to have your team reflect on how they have been working and how they would like to work going into the future. And of course, don't be afraid to experiment with new team rituals. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a big lift. Sometimes just try it. Maybe there's somebody who's excited about an idea, try it. And if it's not working for your team, uh, try something else. Uh, yeah, so hope uh, that was helpful. And yeah, I'll pass it over to Alicia. All right. Uh, hi, all. I'm Alicia, product designer on the ecosystem team. Um, I want to talk about how we run company wide brainstorms. Um, so when we're thinking about bringing the whole company in on a brainstorm, it's really key that we keep them really inclusive. Um, and when we talk about inclusivity in our brainstorms, there's two main parts to it. Um, one is to make sure that we have a space for everybody, regardless of their level of context and the core problem to speak up. Um, so what we don't want is a situation where the team that's really sort of intimately thinking about that problem already ends up dominating the conversation. Um, so thinking about ways that we can kind of give everybody context, bring everybody in together. Um, the other part of inclusivity in our brainstorms is ensuring that the tool doesn't create a barrier to entry. Uh, so, for example, we wouldn't want someone who feels like they can't uh, make a mock-up to feel like they can't contribute ideas. Um, we are a distributed team, so we can't literally all get up and walk to a whiteboard together, but that's kind of the vibe we'd like to recreate. Uh, really low fidelity, really easy to just kind of jump in and get started. So with that in mind, um, I'd love to tell kind of a specific story for something that we actually really recently went through, um, but I think a lot of these points are hopefully more broadly applicable. Um, and there is a, a template link uh, that hopefully we can throw in the chat shortly as well that will so show some of the same ideas. Um, so our specific story is, I mentioned uh, I work on the ecosystem team and we were in the process of opening up our PAX ecosystem. So PAX are kind of like plugins for a coded document or extensions for a coded document. And they allow you to do things like uh, connect Figma and Coda directly together so you can see a Figma frame directly in line in your Coda document and it updates live as someone's making changes in Figma. Uh, so we wanted to figure out how we could best help connect the dots back to use cases with all of these new things uh, that folks might be creating. Uh, so kind of the universal problem, like we've got this new very horizontal feature and we wanna make sure that tangible, clear use cases can still arise from that. This was also a problem that anybody across the company uh, could have a lot of really strong opinions on. Um, so we wanted to hear from customer facing folks to know what they were hearing. We wanted to hear from uh, people who had very long term product vision around what they were imagining for the future, um, an opportunity to kind of really bring everyone together. So we started by just opening it up uh, give us a pumpkin emoji if you want to join in Slack. Um, and we ended up grabbing a huge sort of variety of folks across the company to brainstorm together. Um, and so a few things that we did that helped to kind of make this effective. Um, I mean, first and foremost was just to take a moment to kind of level set. Um, so like I mentioned, it was really important for us to ensure that we weren't creating an environment where people who were closer to the problem felt like they were speaking up a disproportionate amount. Um, and so in addition to just laying out an agenda, we wanted to start by posing a few clear questions 
from the perspective of the core team. So kind of sharing out the context for how are we currently thinking about the problem? What are the sort of sub problems that we're considering? Uh, and what's the sort of high level question based framing that we are using and thinking about. Um, but maybe more importantly, in terms of level setting, we took the first sort of half of our time together to brainstorm around the problem itself. Um, so you'll see we've posed this sort of high level question at the very top. What are the current pain points? What are the current problems with finding use cases? Um, and we took a while to just start sharing specific uh, sticky notes that reflect details of those problems. Um, so encouraging everybody, regardless of their uh, prior context, regardless of how much they've already been thinking about this, to just start throwing in restrictions, considerations, other questions that they have, um, and taking this time to kind of ground everybody in the same problem. It's a great opportunity to allow the core team to share even more context, um, and also a great opportunity to allow everyone else to immediately start jumping in and getting everybody in the same headspace. Once we sort of brainstormed around the problem though, we wanted to move on to possible solutions. Um, and in this bit, this was where it was really key to focus on a very low fidelity method uh, to make sure that we were not going to end up in a situation where um, someone felt as though they had to make some sort of beautiful polished mock-up in order to convey their idea. Um, so to do this, we grabbed a bunch of screenshots of UI from across our product and threw them into FigJam. And we encouraged everyone to just copy paste um, and then it was up to the individual. If you want to break out your tablet and sort of draw on top, you're welcome to do that. If you want to grab a sticky note and just leave some text, that's great too. Um, but it really encourages this low fidelity creation process where no one's spending time worrying about the color of a button or what the copy should say. You're just conveying the idea. Um, this also helps us keep the focus on quantity rather than overly focusing on quality and just generating lots of different thoughts. Um, and feedback is important. We wanna make sure that everyone's seeing what everybody else is doing and responding to it. Um, but we try to keep our feedback also similarly low fidelity um, and also maybe more importantly, very positive. Um, so the idea is to not critique anybody's ideas just yet. We're not poking at holes or, or doing little nitpicks. Um, we're doing a very simple indication that you think something is a good idea or worth considering or, or just interesting. Um, so what we do is we use the stamp. Uh, we encourage everyone to stamp with their own face to say like this thing is, interesting or unique. Um, some people will do things like uh, hold down the, the, um, the button so that their face gets bigger to indicate something that they really love. Uh, organically, you'll see sometimes people will throw on like a thumbs up or sometimes people will add stickers. Uh, but the idea is it's a really, really quick way to kind of give an indication of something that you think is interesting and sort of throw your support behind an idea. But it's also quick enough that it gives everyone time to look through this huge variety of ideas and leave a response. Um, so trying to sort of strike that balance between encouraging everyone to see what everybody else is writing, but not spend too long focusing on any one thought. Still a very sort of generative and positive way to approach feedback. Uh, so taking all of that together, this brainstorm that we did ended up with hundreds of different ideas, lots of great questions and thoughts. Um, and we were then at this point kind of thinking like, well, now what? Um, we want to make sure that we keep moving forward with momentum. We want to make sure that we can turn this into something tangible. Uh, and so for us, our next step was to basically write a, a report that abstracted all of those themes. Um, so we created a CODA document, as you're seeing here, that shows the key themes across that brainstorm. So going back to those problems, what are the key themes that we saw in the problems that everyone identified? What are the key themes across the solutions that we saw everyone identify? Um, and in Coda, we have reactions that allow people to leave a sort of second layer of feedback on top. So now that you're seeing not just individual ideas with your sort of sticker face on them and fig jam, but now you have a chance to leave additional feedback in terms of the high level themes or takeaways that really resonated with you. Um, this is a great opportunity also to help bring along the whole company for the ride. Um, so everybody who was able to join for just that session, but isn't part of the core team, gets a chance to see the output of all of their work and kind of follow up on what's gonna happen next. Um, and for people who had a conflict or weren't able to make it, they can still see what came of that in a way that's much more skimmable um, and much more quick, but they also have a chance to leave their own feedback and their own notes. Um, so taking all of this together, we had one last section all the way at the bottom of our report that said, what can we do now? Like of all of these ideas, the things that were really exciting that resonated with folks that felt like they addressed a need, um, what's actionable, what can we do? Uh, and what was amazing for us to see was that there were a few ideas that were really tangible that we were able to execute on pretty much immediately after. 
Um, so a really specific example is if you go to coda.io slash gallery and you look at a pack, in this case, we're looking at the Twitter pack, um, we have this docs using this pack right rail, um, and that came about through that brainstorm. So it was an amazing way for us to see how bringing the whole company together to brainstorm around this really thorny problem allowed us to sort of germinate this, this solution really from, from seed all the way to the end um, and kind of bring everyone along for the ride for it. Thanks so much. Uh, I will pass it over to Steve. Awesome. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi again. I'm Steve. I work with a fantastic group of folks uh, focused on building a core product experience for teams. So things like collective knowledge, sharing, companion tools, and so forth. Uh, and then uh, designing ways to enable monetization for the product. So uh, awesome stuff that Alicia and Helena just shared. Uh, in this part, we'd love to share a bit about how we use Jams as a forum for designers and product managers to come together. So while designers drive many aspects of the design, uh, it's shaped together with other product minds across the team. And I think it's fair to say design isn't just created by designers. What we articulate into a tangible form and then sweat the details over in Figma are heavily influenced by the framing that we define together up front. And it takes a lot to bring alive what we envision to pixel level perfection. Uh, and this also isn't possible only by designers. So uh, in order to best connect these dots and come away with the most impactful ideas, uh, we felt that it's important to have a regular forum to mind meld across the different parts of a project. So from you know, exploring early problem spaces to pushing the last mile details, so we've been thinking about how might we get everyone uh, to ask product questions before jumping into visual explorations, uh, as well as keep the same questions in mind while we evaluate design variations down the road. And how do we build a forum where the team can go deep and fast into problems uh, while minimizing additional context sharing? Uh, we experimented with a couple of different ways to do this. Uh, and one of the rituals that you know, became sticky for us uh, was a joint weekly jam uh, with designers and product managers. And in this forum, we cover a broad range of topics. So including the usual suspects like jamming and riffing on broad design explorations. Uh, while that's been great to do together, uh, I wanna focus today on a few adjacent jams uh, or jam types that's been uh, just as uh, impactful. So uh, first one, um, framing what we are solving for, uh, framing how we should weigh and balance the different considerations, shape everything that comes after. And, and I think part of design is designing this framing and it starts way before we start visualizing ideas. Leveraging the benefits of uh, product managers and designers looking at the same problem from diverse angles. Uh, we try to poke holes and stress test different framing to land on the best one at the end of the day. Uh, a big part of this is all of us asking product centric questions. And here are some of the key ones to, that we ask uh, each relevant to different phase of a project. Uh, so starting up on top, uh, what are the most important questions that we want to answer? Very simple, but uh, this is very helpful in uncovering the range of problems that relate to the topic at hand and where the team's focus may converge or diverge. So a simple exercise of adding anonymous ideas, upvoting, then talking through the most controversial ideas really help here. Uh, this can also highlight how to approach quantitative and qualitative research next. Um, second, uh, what are the trade-offs? So when there are framings of options that can lead to very different directions, uh, discussing and painting a picture, uh, uh, not literally, but painting, painting a, an idea of how each can impact either the strategic or the engineering trade-offs can go a long way. Uh, and we usually often look out for any one-way doors here. Uh, as an example, one of the aspects our uh, monetization team considers often is how do we balance the best experience for users and, and really thinking through how some of the details that we want to light up in the solution can compound towards business impact. Third, uh, what do we consider as success and what metrics should we try to measure and move to get there? 
Um, asking this question together as a design and product team uh, really helps connect things up to the ultimate goal and spark concrete ideas around how we measure success uh, if we pursue a certain framing and run towards a solution. Uh, this is also very applicable further down the design process when you might be evaluating design variations or interpreting signals from A-B testing. And lastly, how does this decision impact others? Um, there can be different facets to consider here. Uh, does it add to or move away from broader strategy that we're thinking about as an org? Uh, how does this fit in uh, to the broader uh, user journey across the entire product? Are there any uh, um, engineering uh, considerations that other teams might be actively investing in? Uh, being mindful upfront can help really orient which framing uh, can add to or lead to the most impact. Uh, here's a couple of examples, specific examples of uh, what we've jammed on uh, with these lens. So this is one uh, where our product and design team jammed on a, a couple of scenarios to consider and prioritize uh, how to improve organization of content in Coda. Uh, we start out with an anonymous brainstorming, uh, have a set of columns everyone can, you know, simply vote on. So in this case, we had four, uh, must solve for, nice to solve for, not sure about, not anytime soon. Uh, and then have deeper discussions around uh, the ideas that were most controversial. So as an example, ideas that either had the most conflicting outputs on solve versus not, not solve were, were great candidates that we really dug into. Uh, for the other ideas that, Add unanimous sentiment. Uh, this exercise is very simple and effective way to uh, create that shared validation across, across the team. Uh, this was an example from how we started on effort around better understanding teams. So teams and how we set them up for success is a, is a very important focus at Coda, uh, but this is also a topic that can quickly turn very, very broad. So before defining the initial project focus, we first jammed on the questions that Codens would find most helpful to learn about, which is part of the screenshot you see here. Uh, what we gathered here was synthesized into different framings uh, to approach the research. And we ultimately leaned into the direction that, that would help us build momentum uh, most effectively without losing the broader sight of everything that we want to understand over time. Uh, lastly, this is an example uh, from when we were deciding how to surface templates uh, within Coda. So compared to the prior examples, this one uh, is much more focused and grounded, uh, especially with uh, specific trade-offs, as well as uh, we had a very opinionated leaning proposal, which is the one highlighted in green. Uh, jamming with a leaning proposal uh, can add a sense of uh, additional urgency uh, and help, help bring up stronger uh, reactions for or against an idea. So in the past, I also tried intentionally marking an option that I actually had the lowest conviction on uh, as the proposal uh, in order to still manage and see if we're missing anything as a team. <laughs> so when we first started expanding uh, the nature of topics to cover at GMs, uh, naturally many, many still evolved around design mocks. You know, that was natural. Uh, so we had to be a bit more intentional about encouraging uh, broader mediums uh, from the team. So that topics will include you know, problem spaces, North Stars, research questions, and others as a regular topic. Uh, very tactically, um, this is something that's worked out really well for us. Um, so adding a set of uh, columns or kind of jam type options uh, that go beyond uh, explorations really helped here. So this is like an example from an actual jam topic doc that we use uh, within our team. And, and also explicitly encouraging multiple forms. So bring Figma, bring Coda write-ups, bring Fig Jams, bring even dashboards, uh, really help to set the tone for what's okay and good to mind meld together on. So a uh, second aspect that I'd like to share uh, is how joint jams have been great uh, for aligning on quality. So what we care about in terms of quality directly translates to the craftsmanship that goes into the work and what users end up seeing and experiencing the product. So and I think we all agree, quality and details matter. Uh, however, quality is subjective and, and it's not binary, right? Um, everyone can care about quality, but they might have a different bar for 
uh, what meeting the quality bar means or can be caring about different aspects. So some people might care about optimizing for a performance as, as a way to push quality. Some people care about pixel level perfections. Others think about how elements transition in and out and so forth. So how do we, you know, what can help set a high bar that is shared and understood uh, together cross-functionally? Um, you know, in a way it's obvious, but you can learn a lot about each other and uh, what each person cares about by jamming on not just the broader themes or uh, directions, but also on the very specific details together. Uh, and whether that be um, pixel level details or debating over what should be the right copy. So we wanted to make sure there is a space to review such last mile details as a cross-functional group, as opposed to maybe designers just discussing and taking what we thought were P0s and to our cross-functional partners. Um, uh, through uh, these types of jams, really listening to the types of feedback, advocacy, or pushback each person shares, or, or have the absence of, then really going back and forth uh, to land and decisions for these specific details can really help close the gap on how everyone thinks about quality. And uh, we found that you know, this turned out to be a much more natural and an effective exercise than someone just stating what the quality bar should be and then asking everyone to meet it. Um, this has been very valuable, um, uh, especially given that the bar that we set and share here up front cross-functionally ends up influencing the tougher priority conversations down the road, uh, which determines uh, the details that actually become real versus details that we thought about and hoped for. Um, to sum up uh, what we tried and learned, um, you know, by making JAM a joint forum for design and products, uh, we were able to expand what it means to uh, jam together, really pulling designers more upfront to broaden perspectives and shape the framing together, um, to pulling you know product managers and other partners to the last mile to to build a shared quality bar for the fit and finish. Um, jams have also become a great forum outside each product project team uh, where there is a standing group of people who have enough context and a broader knowledge as a collective um, to jump into meeting questions quickly and, and share thoughtful feedback. I hope uh, some of these have been helpful. Uh, I think that's it. All right, thank you guys so much for sharing us uh, some insight onto your experience with your team jams and just some of the details around how you uh, ran it. Um, in case people missed it, Vanessa has shared links to some of the Fig Jam templates that they've created for us um, inside the chat. So definitely navigate there for it. Um, now let's dive into the Q&A portion of um, our call. So if anyone has any questions, please enter them into the Q&A portion. That's kind of where we um, can better keep track of these questions that come in. Uh, so yeah, first question is for, I believe, um, Helena. So this question is asking, as a lead designer, which rituals do you organize between designers and developers to improve collaboration and team spirit? For context, this specific person's team is international and um, they're trying to figure out how to have just more connection between designers and developers and also just create general synergy and discussion with remote rituals. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think actually, you know, something like the ritual that Alicia shared, where it's really about bringing different people together, and that can certainly be between designers and developers, um, into thinking about a shared problem space together. That is really, really helpful and can feel really focused. So it doesn't have to be super abstract. Um, it can just be like, hey, we're about to kick off a project. What is the general problem? Let's maybe jam on, you know, um, related problems to it, possible solutions in a really low fidelity way. Um, yeah, like Alicia shared, I would, I, I think that that's one really good uh, way to go about that. Alicia, do you want to maybe talk more about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think maybe for a little bit more context, um, in our, our larger brainstorm, we absolutely brought developers in um, to have part of that, uh, that conversation. And I think 
Um, one way to really kind of bring everyone together is to take a moment to let everybody take off their usual day-to-day -day hat and think about the problem in a really holistic way. Um, so even going beyond that, you know, there's a, a chance for, for some of our engineers and developers to make little tiny mock-ups and draw things that they think would be interesting to see in the product um, or share what they think might make sense from like a marketing solution perspective too. Um, and I think that that sort of moment of bringing everyone together to think about a problem outside of what everyone's going to actually do when that session ends um, allows everyone to also have a, a more open mind, have a chance to learn more about what people are interested in and are thinking about outside of just executing on, on the day to day. Um, and is also just a great way to facilitate some discussion and, and chat um, in a little bit more of a casual way. Yeah. Um, just to add on to that, another thing, another ritual, I guess, or a process that's really uh, been helpful is, well, obviously, whenever we have a planning cycle, uh, having having cross-functional partners be there to give input, but also getting really clear alignment around what, what's the ultimate goal that, that our team should be obsessing over or feel very responsible for achieving. Right. And then and then making a clear connection on how different efforts could build up to that. Um, and, and I think uh, looking at the possible investments or how we might collaborate uh, from that lens, maybe one step away from specific solutions, uh, I think does also help uh, organize and think about how, how the team should be working together uh, to achieve those goals as a team. So thank you guys so much for answering that. Um, all right, we have another question came in. I think this is for Alicia. So this is asking around, so who creates the output? Was it a PM or a designer? And also how long did it take? Yeah, so that process of, of kind of translating our, um, our unstructured sort of fig jam generative uh, brainstorm into the sort of condensed structured report um, I think that one in particular was done by a designer. I think that was done by me, but could be done by anyone. Um, I know we had PMs and, and engineers jumping in and giving feedback along the way as well. Um, I think in terms of time, that one might have been like a three or four hour endeavor. We try to keep that sort of time box because I think the, the goal of creating these like higher level themes is to try to find larger buckets um, so that we don't spend too much time uh, getting too far back down into the weeds. Um, but I would say maybe in a, a more general answer for that question, anybody who attends the brainstorm who's on part of the core team ideally would have enough context to be able to work through that, that synthesis report. Um, and so it's, it's usually a matter of who organized the brainstorm, um, who will then sort of carry that thread through to the end. Um, and in, in terms of timeline, yeah, we really try to keep that uh, somewhat time box so it doesn't become a, a multi-day effort. So. All right, um, we have another question that came in. I believe this is for Steve. Um, can you explain how you gather user stories and requirements and how those requirements fit into this? Is the entire team involved? Yeah, um, great question. Uh, I think every team or every project takes this on slightly differently, but um, I think a common common step that I, uh, that I think we all take is um, once we have uh, like a rough framing or like a problem seat that we're gonna go after, we do have a uh, time uh, um, uh, dedicated to really, really do our context building. Uh, and that comes from a mix of quantitative and qualitative um, uh, signals. So in terms of qualitative uh, uh, user stories uh, or requirements, that could really come from everyone, uh, comes from uh, designers or product managers who who've had learnings from prior prior uh, uh, postmortems retrospective uh, in the past also comes from I think a lot of the a lot of the kind of the on the ground conversations that our customers team is having uh, with with different teams that are you know running Coda and what's really interesting is um, a lot of those details you know breathe a lot of uh, life and detail too uh, I think a lot of the insights that we could end up paraphrasing. Um, I think those play a big role. Um, we also have uh, product specialists uh, at Coda who, who think about uh, different and dedicated aspects of Coda that really help build up that deeper uh, foundation of knowledge. And uh, um, 
I think we also kind of look at different metrics and dashboards to help, you know, one validate whether some of the qualitative uh, uh, stories or uh, problems that we're noticing happens at scale, uh, as well as using using dashboards and metrics to figure out um, whether whether there's a uh, um, another type of problem that we just haven't thought about uh, from, from specific conversations. So uh, in short, I'll say context building is a, is a very collaborative uh, effort across everyone in the company. Um, but uh, I think whoever is driving the projects, I think, I think and a lot of times designers drive this phase uh, in, in a lot of the products here. Uh, it's kind of uh, their kind of role to bring these together and start driving towards a set of insights to inform uh, or enrich the framing further. So much for answering that. Um, this next question, I think, uh, could be anyone from the Coda team, but it's asking, what is your synthesis process like out of these rituals? How do you translate insights into actionable tasks? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think, yeah, we also have really different rituals, and I think the synthesis process is quite different for each of them. For something like um, like a team retro in that in that case, um, the idea there is to really see where there's energy, where there's excitement from the team, and kind of like make some decisions right away as a group together in order for it to feel like a lightweight uh, process. That's definitely not always the case. Sometimes you need a lot more time to synthesize. But when you can do that and you're in the moment, it can be helpful to already kind of assign somebody to take something forward um, in, in that kind of scenario. Uh, Alicia and Steve, do you wanna talk about how you have synthesized? Yeah, sure, maybe um, maybe in kind of a, a contrast um, in thinking about like these company-wide brainstorms and the process there for turning something actionable. Some of the ideas that we talked through and that were super exciting were really a lot further out than others. Um, and so you can kind of think about a few different ways of categorizing and looking at all the different ideas that came up. Um, so one similar to what Helena was saying is just about what are the things that feel like they're generating a lot of excitement and interest um, and people sort of uncontroversially think are good ideas to proceed forward with. Uh, but then of course, there's also the, um, the pragmatic angle, which is how much effort will these things take to do? Um, are these uh, improvements that we can make kind of in a couple of hours or in a day or two that won't impact other parts of the product or are they really wide ranging where we'd love to do them someday but now's not the right time. Um, and then looking at how much those ideas are going to move our core metrics or are going to address our core goals. Um, and so a big part of that synthesis process then becomes how do you categorize these ideas across all of these different spectrums and then from it, how do you pull out the ones that are like at the high end of all of them. Like they're easy enough to do, they're not gonna take a ton of time, they address our core goals and they're not controversial. Um, and then as those are easy enough to translate into actual tasks, start to work backwards from there in terms of where the cutoff line lays. I don't know, Steve, if you have other thoughts as well. Yeah, um, uh, love, love this question. Um, I think just adding on to all the great <laughs> insights that uh, folks shared, uh, maybe, um, I think there is usually, I think, two additional types of uh, synthesis or kind of the post brainstorm uh, 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 phases that, that helps make things tangible. One is, I think, more like open ended, like how do we turn these into specific options to react for our guests? And then the other is like having a better sense of uh, one, one that's where you, you kind of have a set. Have an idea of how do things take things forward, and uh, you want people kind of a like a check before you kind of move forward with it. Um, and the first one, uh, uh, like you could have like a very broad uh, brainstorming together uh, around like a specific question. Um, and I think usually you know there's depending on how broad the topic is, those could be synthesized or grouped in many different ways um and i think i think one one thing that's really helped uh making that actionable as well as build momentum is um a synthesize those into a couple of different extremes of uh framing like for example uh one could be like a framing that's oriented around something that's most obvious you know that would have least uh pushback or friction against pushing forward 
but you'd also kind of frame the other extreme where you might go a little bit further out there, uh, but at, at, the, at the benefit of presenting a very, very different perspective on how to synthesize and take these learnings forward. I think, I think having that the open synthesis uh, sentiment gathering or gathering feedback from folks, I think that really helps make these actionable. Um, other times you might uh, brainstorm and then kind of hear, hear a, a set of common feedback that could, you know, that could be turned into like a very actionable plan, like right after. Uh, in those cases, um, uh, we would kind of go uh, rather than keep things more open-ended, frame it more like, okay, this is a proposal for next steps uh, and kind of either kind of click on looks good to me kind of acknowledgement button, or if you have a strong pushback, just let us know uh, and let's talk through that. So a slightly different approach, I think, between the two types, but I, I think those have helped make things uh, actionable uh, post, post brainstorming. Okay, um, I think we're gonna just take maybe one more question here. Um, so one of the questions is around, um, how do you handle stakeholders who might dominate your jams, retros, et cetera, uh, without taking away their voice or safety? This is a great question um, and a, a really tough one for sure. I can give a few thoughts. Um, I know Pauline and Steve have some thoughts as well, but I think one, one way that helps uh, balance out voice a bit um, is to break time up between a moment when everybody's generating ideas uh, before launching into those discussions. Um, and the benefit that we see from that is that it gives a moment where everyone can kind of get their thoughts out of their head in a way that's ideally not going to be influenced by what they're seeing other people say. Um, it ensures that everybody is creating thoughts and thinking about what makes sense to them at the same time, rather than waiting for one person to finish so the next person can speak. Um, and then ideally, once we launch into a discussion time, um, everyone's had a chance first to sort of express their opinions um, and have a space for their voice to be heard before getting into any sort of live discussion. Steve or Helene? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we use to help what Alicia just mentioned is uh, we often adopt the anonymous uh, add your idea or add your feedback. And then uh, without revealing who the author is, uh, uh, have everyone who's, who's kind of core to the discussion help vote on the, on the questions that they would like to discuss first. And that ends up informing what, which, which input or uh, uh, questions we end up discussing uh, from from first to the end. So, and I think that's that's a more of a like a concrete ritual uh, that we've been adopting to achieve what Alicia has mentioned, uh, Ikoda. Yeah, and then the only other thing I would add, you know, if you're in a in a context like Fig Jam, um, you know, that definitely is part of the role of being a facilitator. Is sometimes you just have to kind of step in and do a little bit of moderation um, in terms of maybe calling on folks who maybe have written down an idea um, and, and you think it's interesting or you saw that I got a lot of votes and other people thought it was interesting as well and just making space for people to, to talk. Um, and, and, and yeah, and just doing that by kind of calling out and, and making that space and yeah, can, can be difficult to do, but uh, yeah, that's the only thing I would add to that. So, well, I think that's all the time that we have for questions today. Uh, just for some recap, so if you guys are ever interested in tuning in to any future live streams, just go to figma.com slash events and any upcoming ones will be posted there. And then if you have any suggestions or ideas that come up, um, please reach out to us at community at figma.com. Um, again, the recording for this will be available on our YouTube channel um, in a couple of days. So we'll definitely keep you guys updated on that. But yeah, thank you so much to Helena, Alicia, and Steve for just joining us and sharing your knowledge. And thank you everyone who has taken the time to call in and um, join us for our live stream. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks.